get it. Ms. Okay. Gomez. Uh, good evening, and <clears throat> thank you for, uh, for inviting. So what I want to do is um, a quick update on our um, project and then talk about the environmental document that was just released for, for, uh, for circulation and for public comment. So I uh, just want to start about the construction packages. So we do have uh, three construction packages that uh, uh, have been uh, executed. And a lot of construction up in uh, the Madera, Fresno area. We have 15 construction sites in, in the first construction package. We got two construction sites in the second package we've started uh, in Kings County. And then construction package four, which does take us into Kern County through the city of Wasco, we're expecting to start seeing some heavy construction around Garces Highway. Specifically, they're going to start drilling for some test piles uh, for the overpasses. So we'll start seeing some uh, construction activities uh, in, in uh, Kern County. I want to show a quick video, see if, uh, I don't know, we'll ha have the volume. Very low. Oh, I, I could describe it. So this is the, the latest construction site, which is at Tulare Street. We're building an underpass in. to raise the embankment three feet. Eventually that embankment will connect to the bridge crossing over high-speed rail tracks. Incredible progress is being made on three of the most visible projects on the system. Dozens of girders have been placed at the San Joaquin River Pergola. This structure will support high-speed rail tracks as the train travels over the top of existing freight lines. Just last week, crews poured 1,400 yards of concrete along the stems of the pergola. To the north of the pergola, the San Joaquin River viaduct construction continues, with crews preparing the bridge deck of the first section of the bridge. In South Fresno, the Cedar Viaduct stretches into the air alongside Highway 99. Crews are finishing the bridge at the north end of the viaduct while other crews are preparing to finish the span that will stretch across North Avenue, connecting the two completed sections of the viaduct. Along State Route 180, crews are beginning preparations for the next traffic switch, as the excavation work under the highway is ready to move to the next phase. Excavation of the trench itself is taking shape. This is the only place where high-speed trains will go below grade in construction package one. A major milestone was crossed this month at the State Route 99 realignment with the opening of the Clinton Avenue Bridge. For now, cars can cross over the bridge, but the on and off ramps will remain closed for a few more months. So it just gives you a quick view of, of some of the construction sites. Uh, so I want to talk a little bit about the environmental document. So the approach that uh, we took in putting together that uh, document was, you know, more collaborative approach. Oops. Go back. Um, trying to balance out all the multiple uh, priorities, the ag land, the noise, uh, some of the environmental mitigation uh, that we needed, uh, that we would have to accomplish. So here's kind of the, the timeline uh, and then also the next the next steps. So as you remember, we uh, selected the preliminary preferred uh, in May of 2016, and uh, and so we've been spending this time preparing the document and um, and and circulate, uh, getting the comments, doing the the testing, collecting all the data, and we and getting comments from our federal partners, incorporating those, working with the local uh, agencies along the alignment and um, uh, preparing the document. So the document is now complete. Uh, it has, uh, it's out for circulation. So these are some of the, uh, some of the things that we've been doing, stakeholder meetings, community open houses, both in Bakersfield and in Shafter. Uh, we had also a joint open house along with the Federal Railroad Administration 
And then we had uh, open houses in the uh, city of Shafter. Uh, we then started to again con put the document together. And uh, uh, so here in November, the draft supplemental document is out. So the public comment period ends on January 16th. Uh, we, we extended it beyond the holidays. We'll have a public hearing here in Bakersfield on December 19th uh, in the downtown area. And then uh, as we prepare, take all of the comments, provide our response to comments, finalize the document, and um, get it finally approved. Some of the, here are some of the key considerations that you'll see in the document. I'm not going to run through all of them, uh, but uh, you know, very extensive um, studies that we had to do. So you, all that you would see in, in the uh, existing uh, document. So here, go back. So here is uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about the the locally generated alignment, and we comparing that to the existing hybrid alignment that was in the original document. So in May of 2014, what we had was the, we paralleled the BNSF rail corridor uh, through the city of Shafter, and then we came uh, into the city of Bakersfield. Um, the, then there was the, um, after that document was approved, we've had so several uh, lawsuits, and so we ended up working. I think this thing has a mind of its own. So it's kind of just going. Um, <clears throat> so we, working with uh, the, both the city of Bakersfield and Shafter, we came up with the, the locally generated alignment. So the city had provided us to uh, to us an alignment, and uh, for the past year, we've been tweaking it and making it make sure that it meets our criteria. It also does include a station at F Street and Golden State. The uh, previous station that was studied was at, at Truxton. Some of the merits of, of the uh, LGA, uh, the aquatic resources are less, noise and vibration are, are less, uh, the aesthetics and visual are less, and then the agricultural lands uh, were impacting less, and then the community impacts and land use. So. Uh, here's some of the details you can see from the yellow is is the LGA and the blue was the existing document. So this is the uh, in, in terms of impacts to the waters. Here are in terms of noise and vibration. You could see which one. Um, you could see that the LGA has less impacts in terms of noise uh, to residents, churches, and uh, houses. We are near one uh, one of the parks. So this is in terms, again, looking at the impacts uh, in terms of uh, facilities, community. So we had 11 community facilities impacted with the previous alignment. This one has seven. In terms of residents and businesses, as you can see, we had um, over 392 with the uh, with the uh, hybrid and then 377 with the with the LGA so you have 78% um, fewer homes are going to be displaced uh, with the LGA and then this kind of just shows again the blue is is the um, is the original document and then the yellow is the LGA So it talks, as you can see, you know, from community facilities, the farmland, the uh, commercial and industrial displacements, and then the residential displacements. So it gives you an idea that the LGA has a lot less impacts. The station planning, uh, so we have been working with the city um, for the station planning, and I think, um, so there's a lot of activity and work has already has already been done around uh, the station. And I think that that would take a lot, a whole nother workshop just so we can go through uh, what kind of work has done, been done around the uh, station planning. But um, the, um, the city did come up to our transit and land committee and pre gave a presentation, a very well received presentation about all the work that is currently being done. So I would 
recommend that there'd be a whole separate workshop around just what happens with the uh, all the activity that's been happening with the station planning efforts. Uh, here are some of the benefits um, of the grade separations within the city of Shafter and the um, locally generated alignment. Uh, we're eliminating at grade crossings would provide additional benefits. Uh, so we're eliminating the you know potential for collisions and hazards, and again, uh, um, improving the traffic circulation. So these are some of the benefits in terms of the locally generated alignment that were not in the previous alignment. So this is kind of what we have through uh, what we're proposing through the city of Shafter. Before it was on a viaduct, uh, leaving the existing at-grade crossings in place. And then here's what we're having proposed where we are putting ourselves and the BNSF on retained fill and allowing for traffic to move under uh, both of us, both the BNSF and the high speed rail. <clears throat> Some of the uh, other overall benefits, uh, we have the increased economic development around F Street Station. Uh, we have decreased impacts to the residents and business, as we already talked about, and the community facilities. So these are the next steps. So right now we're in the circulation. We got a 60-plus 60, 60 day period to, to work within the, um, within the, the federal, what the FRA is required to do. And so from now until January 16th, we'll be receiving comments. And then we, uh, as I mentioned, December 19th, We'll be back here in Bakersfield. The event, the public hearing starts at 3 p.m. So we'll be present along with our federal partner, uh, listening to the public comments, collecting them. Uh, you can go and see the document. It's been placed also in the uh, in the libraries uh, and around uh, within Shafter and Bakersfield. The document is also on our website, and it also provides for you to provide comments on the website, via mail, or verbally when uh, on, on the 19th. So that's uh, what, what are the next steps for the document. So with that, I leave it open for questions, comments. Do we have any questions from the public? Yes, sir. You have to come up to the microphone. Den Dennis, you can come up here if you want. There's a microphone here if you want, Dennis. You can come up and use this microphone, or you can use the one at the podium. Yeah, there was mention on Dennis Fox, by the way. And uh, you're mentioning the uh, waters. It goes over the city of Bakersfield's water supply. Excuse me, Mr. Fox, would you speak into the microphone more, please? Okay, how's that better? You got gnomes back there, but anyway, <laughs> the uh, I was just wondering if there's going to be anything in case of derailment, if they'll be uh, taking that as a as a possible hazard, or is it a hazard? You follow? I'm getting at at the the water agency on the north side. There's uh, the water treatment plant, and then it goes over the river, but. It already has water in it. But I was just wondering if that's going to be a deal. And uh, also, they might they wonder about um, the location of the uh, Westchester actually is pretty good. But I was just wondering if by the uh, robot 20th, by the fire station, those empty areas, because uh, people can get off the high speed rail. And then they can get on the high-speed bus because that's where the buses are and that's also where the panhandlers are. How are you going to deal with those? Thank you. And dopers, they love the, the word. When you mention speed, I imagine they like that. So we are, we are working. Oh. Comments first, then, or respond to questions? Well, I was going to respond to his question. Okay. <laughs> yeah, so we are working with uh, the city in terms of as we come through there, um, 
and we have already met with the, the water agency. And I believe we're on a viaduct there, so we'd be having, they'd, we'd have uh, parapets on both sides. Um, so you'd have to, it hit first the parapet before it goes over into the water supply. Good evening, Madam Chair, members of the board. My name is Troy Hightower. I'm a consultant. And first of all, I'd like to thank Ms. Gomez for coming here and providing information on the project. My question is related to the illustration you had on the berm in um, Shafter. And I'm wondering how high the berm is and how many miles of that is in the city of Shafter. So the berm is, so we have to have the the clearance of just like a typical Caltrans over overpass. So I believe it's, I think we're between 18 and 24 feet. And then it goes through the portion within the populated portion of the city of Shafter. So um, as we enter into Shafter, uh, we start, um, I wanna say First Street is, um, don't have them all memorized, but uh, Fresno, yeah, Fresno. And then we, yeah, Fresno all the way to Lerdo. And so we get back um, just before Los Angeles is where that, the, the both retained fill ends for both us and the BNSF. Any other questions from the public? Lewis Gill with the uh, Bakersfield Homeless Center. Um, as you know, in 2015, February 2015, we were told by High Speed Rail that they would require our entire, our entire campus. And so since that time, we've been working uh, along with High Speed Rail staff and in good faith uh, to explore uh, early acquisition because um, all parties have agreed that trying to relocate a three-acre facility of our type was not only going to be difficult, but uh, it was going to take a significant amount of time. Um, high Speed Rail has also been made very aware that we have an older facility that needs a great deal of care. And since its announcement, um, our donors uh, have um, not been interested in investing in the capital improvements necessary to maintain our level of service because it's likely to be ripped out. And uh, you know that two weeks ago we received a letter from High Speed Rail stating uh, that they would no longer explore uh, the um, possibility of early acquisition and that we would be waiting up to five years uh, for the possibility of relocation. Um, we've already been through two and a half years uh, of having to deal with this damage. Um, and so uh, my question is, uh, what is it going to require to get the High Speed Rail Commission to respond and to address the harm they're doing our organization. <clears throat> so, um, appreciate appreciate the, the question. So, I've been working with our leadership. So, we have in sense, new leadership, and so we're we have been working, trying to figure out how we could do an early acquisition. And I know, uh, so right now I'm working with with our board. You were at the board meeting yesterday, so we did receive, you know, the email. So I have been talking to our board and trying to see if 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 we can uh, proceed in uh, in getting the public works board to agree to uh, allow us to do an early acquisition. So I'll continue pushing and trying to see how quickly we can do this and. Um, and just working with you to see, you know, if if we can um, convince um, our public, the Public Works Board and our board to allow us to proceed with. So right now, what the, our board wants us to focus on is the portions that we are going to have up and running early. And right now, that's uh, just north of Bakersfield, all the way into San Jose. So they would like for us that to be the priority. And uh, but we do understand the hardship that we're putting on the uh, homeless center. And so I'm hoping that we'll be able to come to some good resolution with that. Any more questions from the public? Board members? Cindy? 
Thank you, Diane, for coming here and giving us your presentation. Um, GET is in a similar situation as the Homeless Center is. We've been waiting for about two and a half years also to, um, we, we've, we've outgrown our facility. Uh, we were in the process of starting construction on a new facility. We purchased the property next door to us so that we could continue, we could start construction without tearing down you know, our existing facility. Uh, my question, I have a couple questions. One is, first of all, what is the definition of early acquisition? What, what? Well, the way we are defining it is um, outside of any potential construction project. So we, right now we don't have uh, any construction projects beyond Poplar Avenue so in, in, in Kern County. And then the next construction package would go to the north. So that's how I define the early piece of it is anything that is outside of any construction package I would consi consider early acquisition. So package four only goes to Poplar. Poplar there Avenue. is no package south of not not Poplar. right now there is not because we've been working on this environmental document so we didn't have um another construction package so the next construction package would be going to the north but you're working on the on the station area plan mm -hmm. but that is outside of the out of package four but you're still you're still looking at the downtown station area yeah we're required uh that was one of the requirements uh from the uh as part of the grant so within the grant there was dollars put in for station planning so we're doing station planning throughout the state working with each of the respective cities so we're doing station planning in palmdale uh station plan planning um here in bakersfield fresno hanford merced gilroy san jose so that that those funds were put in uh, w within the within the grant that we received. So if Get were to go ahead and start putting in improvements, because we we we, we can't even get s any new buses, the the electric buses that we'd like to get because they don't fit in our barn area. I, um, we have a C and G station that we wanted to upgrade. If we were to start doing those upgrades then down the road i mean when are when are we going to find out about the next package and and when we will be in that part of that package so we are currently <clears throat> preparing a update to the business plan which is the draft will come out in february and so that's what we're currently working on right now doing the re in a sense, baseline of all of the, you know, the cost, re-looking at that. And so uh, in February, we'll have a draft, a, a draft um, a business plan that would outline what would be the next steps uh, in terms of um, schedule cost. And uh, so that's what we're, we're focused on now. I did, so I had asked um, in working with, um, with Karen was asking her what are some of the immediate needs that need to be done currently to the existing facility and what potential what are the costs with those so once we have that data then again I can go back to our to our executive team and and and, and show them okay these are the kind of improvements that are being made or that need to be made uh, can we help, can we utilize that to justify proceeding with the early acquisition of the get facility so well, the GET facility is in, in a different position because it's around the station. And <clears throat> they had, the our had board had looked at making some early uh, acquisitions of not just in Bakersfield, but in Burbank. So if we get that data, again, just trying to use it to support, uh, build the case for us to come in and, and do the early acquisition. The homeless uh, center is beyond the Bakersfield station. And so, again, them looking at where we're going to go to construction next and what makes sense uh, to start doing some of that early right away acquisition. So, uh, you know, I'll continue to work with them to get that data and, and hopefully support for us to 
proceed with the with the get now that we have the draft document out that's what we were waiting for uh, we still can't acquire anything until we have an approved environmental document uh, so that's that's kind of what you know my focus is is gathering the data and building the case to uh, do the early acquisition do you have to wait and make any of these decisions for the new business plan until you get a new CEO um, <clears throat> We don't have to wait for that, but I mean, just working with our current with our current leadership uh, to you know be able to do that. But we need the data to be able to do that. Okay, and then I guess my last comment is the station area plan. I just want to make sure that in that planning that both transit is incorporated in whatever plan there is, and also uh, bicycle parking. But um, and bike infrastructure and it, it, it does incorporate that okay uh, pedestrian movement bike movement the transit movement All and right. I, I would suggest that we do a whole workshop just on what has already been looked at in terms of the station planning okay thank you Diane Bob thank you thank you Diane for the presentation and thank you for coming down um, I think it's great that you worked with the city and the impacts are much less uh, in a numerous areas, uh, the number of residences, the number of uh, community facilities, and I think just overall the impacts are less. And so I'm pleased with the, the new alignment <coughs> and happy that the high speed rail worked with the city on that. You solve one problem, you create others, I understand. <laughs> uh, but um, look forward to working with you in the future. Thank you. Thanks. And we do appreciate all of the the partnering with not only the city of Bakersfield, but also the city of Shafter. So we do appreciate um, the staff working with us. Any other comments? Orshel? I, I have a few comments. Um, what's a new completion for the high-speed rail from start to finish? Uh, the new, the, the new. The completion time, we, we don't, will I be alive when it's finished or? Um, right now, the, the, our target is 2025 to get the first segment up and running, which would, what we're calling Valley to Valley, and uh, which would be um, north of Bakersfield to San Jose. And then the rest would be completed within the four years after that. So 2029 then. Mm -hmm. I think Mary Gorilla, you might have kids by then, grandkids by then. <laughs> um, now, the technology you have for the, the train and stuff, has that already been set in stone, or, or you're waiting until another 10, 12 years to come up with that new technology? I'm sure there will be new technology between now and completion time. Has that all been projected already, or are we waiting for that time to come around, the block? Uh, so... <coughs> One of the other construction packages that would come out would be the track and systems. And so that uh, construction package would come out probably within the year, and that's the package that would be looking at that technology. So what, what is the existing technology being used in other uh, systems around the world, and uh, then designing it and then uh, uh, getting it constructed. Mm -hmm. You know, one of my concerns is, in, you know, 12 years from now, they're already talking about drones using to move people around within the cities and stuff. Would, uh, would Amazon, would they uh, have better technology to transverse people from one end of the state to the other end of the state? Probably a lot cheaper and quicker and more efficient. It seems like, you know, because the technology is rapidly changing and stuff, it seems like the rapid uh, high-speed rail is, is past its, almost going to be past its usefulness by the time you get it completed. I yeah. yeah, I'm not sure that 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 you can generate that kind of technology that quickly to move, you know, 300, you know, three to 600 people rather quickly. And I'm not sure what Amazon is working on. Um, it continues to still be is they're still building miles and miles of it all over the world. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> And then what, what percentage of the cost of the high-speed rail uh, is going to all the environmental issues and 
and paying off the environmentalists you know, as far as earth justice, Sierra Club. So what percentage, about 30% to get all the stuff um, in the first cost? What we use as ours is uh, between 15%, 15% is what we allocate. <laughs> okay. And what, some, what's the cost? Some other areas are, you know, have more environmental issues than others. Yeah, I, I know the high-speed rail that is going to be all electric. I believe it's all electric, and it's only all people only understand. That's and correct. so there is no environmental. If a train happens to have a little accident, it's not going to cause any issues at all in the environment part as far as our waters and other than a few headaches and the passengers yeah. in there. Yeah, it's, so it's 100% renewable yeah. and yeah. electric energy. As addressing to the comment on that. But I, I'm, I'm a little cons concerned about the cost and how long it's taken because I know technology changes and it's going more rapid nowadays than, say, 30 years ago. This, this, if, uh, things was rapidly changing and they're already talking in 2022 that there will be no more uh, people driving their own cars no more. It will be all automated and stuff. Even in the trucking industry, it be all automated. And uh, <coughs> I'm just wondering if we're, gonna, if we're building a dinosaur. you going to be a dinosaur towards, towards the completion there. Will it, or will it ever be completed? You know, I didn't check with uh, Las Vegas yet on, uh, you know, what the odds are. <laughs> <laughs> It'd be a good question to ask uh, Las Vegas what the odds are. Well, we are, we are, as you can see, constru in construction, and our goal and intentions mm -hmm. are to get this finished. You know, I, I travel up and down the state and stuff. I, I to the north. I see you in Fresno where they've we done some of the grading and some of the work and some of the uh, uh, bridges or whatever we call it. Um, but it, it's, a, like it's a very, very slow process, you know, it's taking a long time. And like I say, I'm concerned that technology, is gonna, you're not going to catch up with technology. You're going to be behind the scene there time in the next couple of years and see a lot of major changes in California on that. That's my concern with all the tax money going into the project and will it ever be completed and, uh, and out time's all wasted. That's my concern. Okay. Thank you. Bob? Yeah, I just had one more question. I hadn't heard discussion in a while about the maintenance uh, facility, the heavy maintenance. Is that decision? No, that decision still has not been made. And do we have a timeline? I mean, if uh, you're going to. So one of the things uh, at yesterday's board meeting, our board approved the uh, yeah. bringing on of an early train operator. And so they're going to uh, be moving in in December and so then we're gonna be showing them the plans of all our facilities and uh, in terms of does it make sense from an operations point of view and after we get that input then we'd be making that decision any other comments from the board uh, Ms. from the chair please yes, uh, mrs. Gomez um, how much discussion has take has been considered in terms of the clientele to be able to identify a fair rate or a rate that were fair, that would be fair, I guess. Uh, what is the clientele that you project would be using this mode of transportation, and is it designed to target any specific uh, socioeconomic group? Um, you know, we've heard from from previous, um, I guess, workshops. You know, we're looking at businessmen that want need to travel down, so on and so forth. If that's the case, what, the, how much of the population do you project you'll be impacting? And how much would not be able to either afford to or be, I guess, be practical for them to use? The no, high so speed? as part of the business plan, we do a, a whole ridership uh, study. And uh, so we're not, you know, specifically targeting one, you know, one set of a group of just only okay. business people. I mean, it's the, the, the facility would be for anyone that, you know, wanted to get from point A to point B. And we've also looked at the potential costs. So we're looking at it would be, you know, more than a bus ticket, but a lot less than an airline ticket. Okay. So there is a margin, I guess, of There a, is a margin in the business plan. And it, and it, you know, right now I think the fare was between, say, Fresno and San Francisco. Uh, I think it was like $60. Okay. Um, but, yeah, 10 years from now. Uh, they might not be that sixty dollars, but it does. We do sure. as we do the business plan. We do update the the ridership, and then the, also the potential cost for a ticket. Okay, All right. thank you. Oh, thank you. I have a quick question, Madam Chair. One more question. We need to get to our <laughs> next I'll be meeting. 
Yes, I'll be brief. Uh, what percentage of uh, the project uh, has been funded? I know, uh, as of right now, knowing what we think it's going to cost. Uh, right now, what we have is, in terms of the, the dollars that we have, uh, we believe that we have uh, enough funds to get up a segment up and running from, as I mentioned, you know, the Wasco area to, to uh, San Jose. So we're looking at, at, at uh, re we're refining all of the costs now. Okay, and, and, and I assume that uh, some of the struggles in terms of how slow it's taking and, and, uh, and, and the slow process has to deal with just the uncertainty of the, uh, the funding source in the future mm, to complete. No, uh, yeah. it has to do with how you do business in okay. California. Mm -hmm. So okay. it, it yeah. you know, the environmental mm -hmm. document, to produce environmental document, you know, you have mm -hmm. to do all these studies, mm -hmm. and then again, you can only mm -hmm. construct so much so fast. Yeah. Yeah, well, I think more money would help, but, um, uh, you know, I, I, I tend to agree with my, my colleague from, from Taft in terms of uh, how long it's taking. Uh, I was a, a sophomore in high school whenever this thing was passed uh, by the voters of California. I'm not sure uh, how long in the future I'm going to, um, when I will be able to, 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 to use this. Um, but I think that us here in Kern, especially uh, members of the CA collectively, um, you know, have, have some, some influence in this in terms of, of the funding and uh, achieving a sustainable funding source or a, a, a bigger portion of funding to make this happen, especially since, uh, you know, our region has, um, uh, you know, a big benefit and a stake into this. And I think that, you know, the representative that represents this area you know, is, um, you know, right-hand man of the president right now in Congress, and it looks like they passed um, the tax plan uh, on the House side. And so I think that uh, we've got to be able to use our collective influence as elected leaders here in the Valley to be able to advocate uh, on the state and the federal level for more funding. Um, you know, we had uh, Congressman Bill Thomas bring in a big, a big chunk of money here uh, when he was elected in Congress, and we just want to make sure that we, that we continue to see that influence and those money uh, drawn down. And so I think that would be a big help if we would if the federal government would step up and, and really um, help fund uh, this, uh, this project. So those are my comments. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Gomez. Thank you. All right, going into our meeting, everybody. Please stand for the flag salute. I advocate for more funding. Yeah. yeah. Salute, pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Roll call. Thank you, Garola. Present. B. Smith. I am here. Wood. Here. Pasquale. Here. Mock. Cantu. Present. Mauer. Here. Prout. Yes. Pryor. Here. P. Smith. Here. Wegman. Here. Couch. Scribner? Here. Navarro? Here. Para? Here. Kiernan? Here. Thank you. Public comments. This portion of the meeting is reserved for persons to address the committee. Are we ready, everybody? Are we ready? To address the committee on any matter not on this agenda, but under the jurisdiction of the committee. Committee members may respond briefly to statements made or questions posed. They may ask a question for clarification, make a referral to staff for factual information, or request staff to report back to the committee at a later meeting. Speakers are limited to two minutes with the authority of the chair to extend the time limit as deemed appropriate for conducting the meeting. Please state your name and address for the record prior to making a presentation. Do we have any public comments tonight? Yes, sir. Lieutenant Ian Silva, Kern County Sheriff's Office. Just wanted to provide my uh, our monthly update on our Kern COG contract. I'll do it quickly because it sounds like we need to move on to things. So, um, We are in our second quarter of the current contract, which is the fourth contract the Sheriff's Office has partnered with the Kern COG to uh, operate. Since we started this this round in July, there have been 64 work cru uh, work crew sites, roughly 400 uh, correction 504 uh, hours for detention deputy hours. If you add in the inmate hours, about 3,024 man hours. 
Um, that equates to about 30 miles of current highways being beautified for an estimated savings of $80,015. Um, we've been targeting some areas around Bakersfield, Delano, Wasco, McFarland. We've been focusing in uh, Delano recently. There have been some uh, things we've been cleaning up there. But we do ha we have had some teams operating in, in McFarland and uh, Wasco. Uh, there was a request uh, for some specific areas on Highway 46 and Highway 43 from Wasco. So hopefully we've dealt with those to uh, Wasco's satisfaction. If not, please let us know. We'll be happy to come back and hit it again. And as I always uh, like to remind uh, the panel, if there or the committee, if there are any uh, areas of specific uh, area that we need to target, we'd be happy to answer any requests. Most of the time we get contacted through Kern Cog staff or you can contact my office directly. If not, we uh, drum up our own business and find our own messes to clean up. It's, it's usually something out there we can hit, deal with. And uh, since the committee is dark on in December, I'll wish everybody a Merry Christmas, Happy New Year, and answer any quest questions I can cover. Does the so, board have any questions? Highway 33, let me write that down just to make sure. 33 and 40 between that. Oh, yeah. I, I couldn't hear you exactly. I'm sorry. Uh, I thought I had a mic on, but uh, between uh, Taft, I know uh, the Rotary Club takes up part of it up to Midway Road, maybe from okay. Midway Road uh, north to uh, 46. Can I give you my card, sir? Or do you have my contact information just to make sure we're, we can get sure, on the same page? Please. And we will definitely look at that and see if we can target that for you. Other than that, any questions before I step down? Any more comments? That I, that I Thank you very much. Not at all. Here's my card. Do you have any more public comments? Seeing none? The consent agenda. All items on the consent agenda are considered to be routine and non-controversial by the Kern Cog staff and will be approved by one motion if no member of the committee or public wishes to comment or ask questions. If comment or discussion is desired by anyone, the item will be removed from the consent agenda and will be considered in a list sequence with an opportunity for any member of the public to address the committee concerning the item before action is taken. We have items A through H. We have a motion. Motion to approve consent. Second. Roll call vote. Garola? Yes. B. Smith? Yes. Wood? Yes. Pasquale? Yes. Cantu? Yes. Maurer? Yes. Prout? Yes. Cryer? Yes. P. Smith? Yes. Wegman? Yes. Scribner? Aye. Navarro? Yes. Para? Yes. Kiernan? Item number five, 2018 Regional <coughs> Transportation Improvement Program. Mr. Stromoglia. Yes, good evening, Madam Chair and Directors. Kern Cog staff has presented item five over the past eight months. Uh, the capital improvement program has been circulated from this past September and culminated in a draft capital improvement program during the month of October. No changes were made to this item since the October meeting and the Transportation Technical Advisory Committee unanimously recommends approval of the Kern Cog staff recommendation and that is that uh, the 2018 Regional Transportation Improvement Program Capital Improvement Program is shown in Attachment A. And so staff uh, this evening is requesting the following action, uh, that you approve Attachment A, authorize the Chair to sign Resolution Number 1745, and direct staff to submit the 2018 RTIP document to Caltrans and the CTC, California Transportation Commission, by the December 15, 2017 uh, deadline. And this is a roll call vote. Uh, and that concludes my report. Be happy to answer any questions you might have. Any questions? Mr. Smith. My ongoing question will be items that were shelved are still possible. They're just 
being held for funding? We are planning to talk about that next year. I have tentatively, am, I'm looking at a workshop date of January 24th, a Wednesday. I have not, not sent out a save the date yet, but we do want to look at the future RTIP policy and how it can better uh, compete with the latest STIP guidelines, if you will, and so many other things that are going on. As to what we do with our list of 66, Right now, that's <clears throat> less the point, and it's more the point that we look at how we prioritize our projects for the future to be more competitive, if you will. I don't think what we have is broken, but I think we can make it better and more competitive. There's lots of new funding opportunities out there, uh, such as SB1, obviously the big one. And I think our projects might have to be uh, at least looked at again, and what we do with it after that, I think that'll be part of our conversation uh, next year. Thank you. Looking forward to the discussion. Thank you, sir. Kathy? Yes, when did you say the workshop was? I'm going to send out a save the date uh, for Wednesday, January 24th. Hopefully okay. I have that right. We'll probably do it at 10 in the morning, and uh, I'll be uh, inviting our TAC folk and whoever else wants to come and Thank you. start having that conversation. Any other questions or comments from the board? Thank you. Thank you so much. Do you have a motion? So move. Second. Roll call vote. Garola? Yes. B. Smith? Yes. Wood? Yes. Pasquale? Yes. Cantu? Aye. Mauer? Yes. Prout? Yes. Cryer? Yes. P. Smith? Yes. Wegman? Yes. Scrivener? Aye. Navarro? Uh, Caltrans abstain. Para? Yes. Kiernan? Abstain. Next item, 2017 Federal Transportation Improvement Program Draft Amendment Number 11. Ms. Pacheco. Good evening, Madam Chair and members of the committee. The amendment includes revisions to the State Highway Operations and Protection Program, the Safety Program, and the Non-Motorized Program. The public review period began on November 3rd and ends November 17th. One correction was received to add additional local funding to the Rexland Acres Community Sidewalk Project and will become part of the summary of comments for this amendment. The Kern Cog Executive Director will consider approval of the amendment by the end of November. State and federal approval is required. And at this time, I ask that the Chair please open the public hearing, allow for public comment, and then close the public hearing. We'll open the public hearing. Do we have any public comments? Seeing none, I will close the public hearing. Thank you. So is this just an information item? Okay. Next item, Kern Region Active Transportation Plan. Mr. Smith. Uh, yes, Chair. Members of the committee, um, sorry, this is my worst nightmare come true. The PowerPoint, PowerPoint breaks. <laughs> um, the current council of government entered into a consulting contract with a consulting firm, Alta Planning and Design, out of uh, Portland, Oregon to develop a current region active transportation plan. We also had additional funding uh, from the County of Kern, Golden Empire Trans, uh, Trans, Transit, and um, also the City of Bakersfield. The uh, contract was entered into in August of uh, 2016. Um, why plan for walking and bicycling? Uh, it's kind of the new wave in the uh, transportation business, try to get more um, use out of the facilities than just single family or single cars driving with one person in it. Improves safety and comfort, um, transit other destinations, and is healthy and affordable. Uh, the goals of the plan were the accessibility and safety, the connectivity, the community and economic development, and the um, education enforcement and evaluation of the, um, of the projects. This slide shows uh, the types of people that we're planning for, which is essentially all kinds of bicycle users from the long distance tours to the 
racers to the people riding in their neighborhoods, the little kids uh, going around the going around the neighborhood. Uh, also, for the walker, um, provide safety for all types of users, um, small children, uh, elderly, uh, and also very important is the people with limited mobility, people in wheelchairs or uh, canes or have some sort of mobility issue. Um, these were the areas that we concentrated on. Uh, every incorporated city um, was studied along with about uh, 17 or 18 um, unincorporated communities such as Mojave, Rosemond, um, Lamont. Um, the ATP includes um, the existing conditions or the inventory of what we have. Uh, provides uh, recommendations for um, projects and programs, the outreach and the implementation plan. The end product is uh, a short and long range plan uh, that enhances and improves walking and bicycling throughout the region. And as you know, um, pedestrian and bicycle safety is a um, very bad problem here. Uh, I read in the paper that we've had 37 um, pedestrian deaths this year so far and a well-known um, uh, bicyclist was killed two days ago. Tragic accident. So anyway, this was the schedule. Um, we're wrapping the final presentation up and we'll uh, be presenting to the remaining communities in December and um, in January. And further on into the COG agenda, we have a, a a contract extension uh, to accomplish that. The contract was supposed to end in December, but we've had to extend it. Um, again, read the slide, the current conditions and needs, um, very exhaustive report. The report can be accessed. Um, it's 449 pages of the report and 447 pages of appendix. So it's uh, it costs us about $300 every time we print the print the documents. So, if you could access it on the uh, on the web, we'd appreciate that. Thank you. Um, these are examples of existing sidewalk conditions, um, just random in Arvin and in Wasco, uh, Maricopa, which is a kind of an interesting situation because the traffic volumes are so low, they may not need. Um, sidewalks and bike paths because you know the existing facility is adequate as opposed to say in downtown Bakersfield where additional pedestrian and bicycle improvements are, are needed. These are existing bikeways, this is Shafter. Um, we had a very robust outreach. Uh, we had several, well nine walk audits and a number of community uh, events. We also had a, another series of community events in July of August of this year. Um, and again, it can be accessed on the uh, webpage currentatp.org. And again, we had very robust uh, community involvement, and much of it was also available in Spanish. So the project recommendations um, uh, are there's hundreds of projects suggested. Uh, we think that the suggestions are about a, about $250 million to correct um, just the most immediate pedestrian and bicycle improvements. And it also identifies potential funding sources, of which the active transportation program is but one source, and that's being um, greatly enhanced with the SB1 funding. This is an example of uh, the mapping that was occurred and then the project list that was associated with that. Again, these are types of bicycle. I won't go into the, um, again, the areas that we're planning for. And very important to uh, plan for end of trip facilities, uh, bike racks, uh, bike lockers, so that the um, people can be encouraged to uh, use their bicycle or to walk. And one of the most critical factors is the maintenance of the uh, facility. Um, if the bike lane is full of broken glass and rocks and broken up, the people will ride in the street. So it's not just enough to put the facility in, it has to have some sort of 
funding for maintenance into perpetuity. So the five E's are the engineering, the education, the encouragement, the enforcement, and the evaluation. Um, so the project prioritization, uh, we have a suite of high priority, mid priority, or medium priority, and low priority projects for each for each jurisdiction. Um, the priorities are not set in stone, and the document should be considered a living document where it can be amended and not just rigidly um, gone through. And we may take um, one-time opportunities or uh, projects that only come along once in a while. And that's the conclusion of my presentation. I'll be happy to answer any questions I can. Any questions from the board? Mr. Cantu? Thanks to the Chair. Thank you. Um, Mr. Smith? Yes. Um, I was reading through it, and I noticed uh, that the term disadvantaged communities doesn't have a definition, but it's included in the context. So I was curious, how would a small community like McFarland, for example, qualify under the priorities if, if, it's, it's, a, if it's, it's emphasizing, you know, disadvantaged communities? Is, what, it's, what a, would be it's, a, it's a function of income. Mm -hmm. So that, um, well, in fact, all of Kern County qualifies as a disadvantaged area based on income okay. against the state of California. And then there's more disadvantaged communities within the greater Kern County area. Okay. Um, that's why we've done so well in the active transportation program. Uh, Kern has the highest success rate of any county in California, not for a good reason because we have, um, you know, so I'm many so many poor areas. Yeah. Um, but it is a uh, there's other criteria, educational attainment, uh, environmental issues, um, people of color or ethnicity, um, and that's that's how that's how it's determined. It's a, but it's a formula basis to set priorities, right? On projects, um, well, the projects the projects are are submitted, um, so that most of the projects that are being recommended in the ATP or in this plan are safety based, mm -hmm. rather than simply because the project is in a disadvantaged, disadvantaged community. Area. Okay, it's a, a safety base. So, an area that may not be extremely disadvantaged could have a project before an area that mm -hmm. was disadvantaged because of the safety rating of that of that particular okay. that particular project. Okay. Okay. Now um, I noticed when I was reading that <coughs> proceeds from the state cap and trade program, uh, SB five thirty five are also allocated. So some of the funding for I guess for for this type of uh, uh, research that we've conducted would be uh, monies that we could that we either current cog or cities could uh, I guess Go after with through. Uh, how could we use this data to help us with uh, well, seeking it provides, uh, funding? Well, it provides the data for the uh, evaluation of the of the project selection, um, safety criteria, um, cost benefit analysis, um, uh, and those are the two major two major points that can be used to to suggest projects. Yes, yes. Uh, they also get points for um, the region having a plan okay. Okay. under the active transportation program. There's a number of other programs um, locally that also provide funding for transportation infrastructure. Okay. Um, one thing that I think we need to, I mean, just editorializing, is to provide more money for um, uh, educational programs. Yeah. Uh, how to be a pedestrian, um, That's true. you know, how not to ride your bike the wrong way down the busy street. Um, and those are not as popular as infrastructure improvements because they're hard to measure. Okay. I mean, I, I, I put in a sidewalk and I can, I can quantify that, that improvement. Um, teach 40 kids how to <laughs> use a crosswalk. Exactly. I don't know whether it saved a life or not. It's hard to quantify that that uh, that outcome. Yeah, that's true. That's true. No, no. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your information. Any more comments from the board? Bob. Thank you, Pete, and thank you for the presentation. <coughs> and really, the the purpose of this is to. Okay. I'm sorry, Bob. No, I was just responding to Mayor Cantu is. So that we can go after more funds, is mm -hmm. once we have a plan, then 
uh, the ATP program is really written uh, so that if you don't have a plan, it becomes more difficult <coughs> to get the funds. Um, uh, another thing I'd like to point out is um, further study is going to be required for any project that is that is submitted. I mean, you can't just take these these projects off the shelf and you know insert the uh, the wording and get the get the funding because the the projects are so localized. In other words, it's you walk around the block and. You know, there may be crack sidewalk and tree in the middle and a signpost. And I mean, if we went to every little place in the whole county, I mean, it cost fifty million dollars to do a plan like this. So each each individual project that's that's forwarded again has to have its individual design, uh, its individual criteria of how um, uh, how it ranks. Um, so the plan is not an end all for every situation in in current and we're we're in what is it cow cow who is there's a cow bike cow bike that we're getting a we're supposedly getting a grant from cow bike um for working with them um oh for the that would that would further stationary stand yeah stands. um again cor uh more detailed studies on corridor studies um Complete streets, uh, things like that, which would be additive to the uh, to the ATP. Um, we recommend approval. Staff is recommending approval of the current active transportation plan to the current council of government. So that's the action we want you to take. Madam Chair, I have a question. Okay. Um, when we have submitted um, ATP projects in the past, the different communities that have sent, submitted them that were not successful, yes. do we incorporate that data into a plan? Do we still keep that data and somehow, because the needs don't go away right. because the plan wasn't improved, mm -hmm. do we keep that data handy to say this is what a need for in, in my community, yes. for example, I need to fill in all the blank spaces where there's no sidewalks so that we have people, pr well, Right. As best we can, keep them out the, of the street. The short answer is is that the 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 work was not wasted. That it adds <laughs> to the body of knowledge of the need, dem the demonstrated need within your community. Okay. Um, you know, in many of the programs, they're oversubscribed by you know a factor of ten, twenty times. So, just because your project wasn't funded doesn't mean it wasn't a bad project. Oh, no. um, but it's 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 the. You know, and uh, particularly with the ATP, which is um, the applications are reviewed, and you don't know exactly who's reviewing them or what kind of criteria they're using to evaluate them. So it's kind of a black box um, um, process where other programs are quantitative, um, you know, ranked. I mean, mm -hmm. highest points wins, next highest points, then we just go down the list until we're out of money. But again, no. it says they're almost always oversubscribed. No, I understand that. And, uh, you know, I wouldn't even suggest that they weren't even serious projects. But uh, I would think that if we maintained some, uh, some of that data, we can go back and, and maybe reevaluate yes. with them what the criteria is right. so we can better understand it. Because it doesn't mean that any of our projects are not valuable. They're very valuable to our individual communities. Yes. Um, and, and I understand it. It seems like it's a PR thing if you do Honestly, if you're doing the right PR to get it approved or mm -hmm. something like that, but I mean, I'm not making any assumptions. But that's no. Um, uh, in all the programs that we administer at the COG, the the safety element bubbles to the top. Yeah. Um, Y'all have uh, done a great job at that too, by the way. Yeah. Um, uh, and everything else is kind of well. It's not secondary, but the safety consideration is is that is the number one issue. Um, aesthetics is ranks low. Um, connectivity is high, but it's not the it's not it's not the primary. Um, so for instance, I mean the Kern River bike path, which is now thirty two miles long, it was two miles here, a mile here, a mile here, and it took twenty five years to accomplish it. And that's, I think that's the, what you have to look forward to. You can't just hope for, you know, $10 million to build 
and it's just a very incremental, very incremental process. I agree. Uh, that's what we do with sidewalks, you know, just a little bit at v a time. Very incremental. Yeah. Thank yeah. you, sir. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Thank Move you. to approve. Second. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? <coughs> Thank you. <coughs> Caltrans report. Thank you. Good evening, Madam Chair, uh, members of the committee. Michael Navarro with Caltrans filling in for Gail Miller this evening. It's a pleasure being back before you. A um, handful of projects to report on. Uh, Shafter Wasco ADA ramps. Uh, that project constructed ADA curb ramps on State Route 43 in Shafter and Wasco. That project is complete. Um, Kern Avenue pedestrian overcrossing. Uh, th that project consisted of ADA compliance upgrades on the Kern Avenue overcrossing. Currently, the contractor is in the process of, ins of installing handrail and bridge fence. Delano Roundabout, the intersection of State Route 155 at Browning Road. That project is complete and is currently in plant establishment. Uh, Famosa State Route 4699 Bridge, that is a bridge replacement project. Um, contract started site preparation on October 2nd, and they're currently working on drainage systems on the on and off ramps. State Route 99 Taft Highway Rehab Project, it's a pavement rehab project on State Route 99 in the city of Bakersfield from north of Herring Road overcrossing to the Pacheco Road overcrossing. Um, that project was awarded security paving on October 2nd, and the contract was approved by headquarters. Uh, the contractual obligation for first working day is December 20th. However, due to anticipated holiday traffic, we may delay that opening construction day slightly. And lastly, Route 46 Conventional Highway, Segment 4A. This project widens State Route 46 from a two-lane to four-lane conventional highway between Lost Hills Road and I-5. Uh, bids were open on November 1st. The project came in almost right at bid. It was slightly higher at 0.68%. So about 1% within the engineer's estimate, but there's sufficient funds available to award that contract, and we anticipate that contract will be awarded in mid-December. Uh, with that, I'd be happy to try and answer any questions you may have of me for Caltrans. Any questions for Caltrans? Mr. Navarro, uh, through the chair, did you, did you give a completion date for the pedestrian bridge in McFarland? There was not one included, but I'd be happy to look it up okay. for you. Maybe after the meeting I can follow sure. up with you. Thank you. Thank you. Question? I have a question on uh, Rosedale Highway west of 99 to Mohawk. Um, the, the improvements when, when the city and the county did the improvements to Rosedale Highway, they included a paved shoulder, and also we will have a paved shoulder on the 24th Street improvements. And that Caltrans portion. Uh, it's got a wide outside lane, but it has no paved shoulder or bike lane, and so I'd like for Caltrans to look at paving a paved shoulder or a bike lane there, so it connects to the rest of the system. Is Thank there? You. Is there? I apologize. I'm probably being very familiar with that area because I handle mostly Northern County. Is there a gap there where there's a gap between shoulder and bike lane you're referring to? That you're looking to have filled in is that no it's just a it's a very wide line I, I don't know if it's 16 18 feet but it's not there's no stripe for a paved shoulder no stripe for the paved shoulder okay you said rosedale highway west of 99 to mohawk yes okay thank you thank you thank you caltrans thank you executive director's report good evening madam chair and board members i just have three four quick items kern cog will be hosting a transit symp symposium for our transit operators on January 10th from 9 to 1, and it will be at the Four Point Sheridan in Bakersfield. I attended uh, Focus on the Future, which is an annual transportation conference in San Francisco, October 29th and 31st to through the 31st. The California Air Resources Board will be meeting in Sacramento December 14th and 15th. And the California Transportation Commission will be meeting December 6th and 7th in Riverside. Uh, subject to any of your questions, that concludes my report for tonight. Any questions for the executive director? Seeing none, thank you very much. Going into the current Council of Governments agenda, the roll call remains the same. Okay. Uh, Public comments. This portion of the meeting is reserved for persons to address the council on any matter not on the agenda but under the jurisdiction of the council. Do we have any public comments? 
Seeing none, we'll move on to the consent agenda. All items on the consent agenda are considered to be routine and non-controversial by Kern-Cog staff and will be approved by one motion if no member of the council or public wishes to comment or ask questions. We have items A through G. Move to approve. A second. Roll call vote. Garola? Yes. B. Smith? Yes. Wood? Yes. Pasquale? Yes. Cantu? Aye. Maurer? Aye. Prout? Yes. Cryer? Yes. P. Smith? Yes. Wegman? Yes. Scrivener? Aye. <coughs> Item 4, Kern Council of Government Transit Representative Appointment. Ms. Napier? Yes, thank you, ma <coughs> Madam Chairman and members of the board. Uh, the Federal Transit Administration contacted Kern, Kern Cog staff and advised us that Kern County transit operators must be represented by one elected Kern Cog board member appointed by the Kern Cog board. The role of the transit representative will be to advise the board as appropriate about transit related planning, funding, and operations. The appointment will commence immediate, immediately upon selection by the Kern Cog board. Staff recommends the chairperson open a discussion to request one Kern Cog board member from a municipality that administers or operates major modes of transportation to serve as the Kern Cog transit representative. Thank you. So we want to do that right now. Do we have any volunteers? What does it involve? <laughs> do you want to answer that or do you want me to answer that? <laughs> We don't think it involves any additional uh, duties or responsibilities at all. We just need to designate an elected official uh, as opposed to an appointed official. Since, uh, Ms. Para has been our transit representative, but the representative from Federal Transit Administration has pointed out that federal law requires that that person be an elected official, and, and Cindy is not elected. And, uh, Madam Madam Chair, and, and operates and has a transit system in their jurisdiction? Okay, I, I'm yes. willing to do it if, unless somebody else wants to. Jennifer, oh, were you interested? No. <laughs> <laughs> I, I would nominate Supervisor Zach Scribner. And I'll second that nomination. Okay, all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Thank and you. if it did entail anything, staff would be very happy to do the work. <laughs> Okay, item five, appointment of community at large members to the Regional Planning Advisory Committee, Ms. Napier. Yes, thank you, Madam Chairman and members of the board. The Regional Planning Advisory Committee bylaws provide for appointment of three at large members representing varied economic, social, and geographic sectors of Kern County. In November 2017, the board received two applications for up to two positions on the RPAC. The RPAC bylaws specific, specify that the term of appointment of the community at large members shall be two years. At the discretion of the Kern Cog Board, community at large members may reapply and be appointed for two additional two year terms, not to exceed six consecutive years. The two people that are currently going off of the RPAC board have served those, those six years. So that's why we're here tonight. Um, and the action is to make up to two appointments um, of the com of a community at large member to the RPAC to begin serving on February 7th, 2018. Mr. Smith, you have a comment? Thank you. Yes, we only received two applications for two appointments. So I would like to continue this and, and direct staff to re-advertise and, and see if we can do some more outreach and, and get more applications. So I would make the motion to continue and direct staff to have more outreach. Second. Do we have a second? Yeah. No. I second. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Executor, executive director's report. Good evening again, Madam uh, Chair and board members. As a reminder, the regional awards nominations are due December 1st. Uh, those of you that volunteered last month um, will come by in December on the 21st. 
the day of our, our board meeting where there will not be a board meeting and we will evaluate those applications. And staff is available between now and then and after then to assist you with any of your applications or questions. Uh, on November 21st, um, there will be a presentation of the RTP and the ATP that was presented tonight to the Taft City Council. In your folder this evening is a copy of the application for the regional awards, summary of outreach dated November 16th, uh, timeline covering November through March, a um, summary that I've go gone over with you in the past that shows the performance of Kern County in delivering their federal projects. The last time I discussed this with you, it was uh, a draft. And just as a reminder, congratulations to, to all the cities and the county for delivering 134.5% of our federal authorization. That means we captured 34% uh, more than we were given in the state. Uh, this particular chart also identifies that we were able to get over $2 million in August redistribution, which comes from other states. So not only did we capture money from other regions in California, we captured money from other states in the United States. Uh, there was a there is a public notice that was printed in the Bakersfield Californian for the um, release of the environmental document that Ms. Gomez spoke about earlier today. And finally this evening, there is a schedule of cash disbursements dated October 2017. Subject to any of your questions, uh, Madam Chair and Board Members, that concludes my report. Thank you. Yes, Jennifer. On the uh, regional awards, who will we direct to and who would we uh, get assistance from? Just Who's the point of contact? Suzanne Campbell, uh, um, if, can, if you can stand up. <laughs> and you can either email her directly or, or go through um, Thank Tammy. You. Thank you. Thank you. Any member statements? Seeing none, this meeting's adjourned. Merry Thank Christmas. You. Yes, Merry <laughs> Christmas. Happy New Year.